As part of today's podcast, we discuss in detail Peterborough United's bond offering. So that we stay on the right side of the law, I have to share this disclosure with you before the podcast. Please note that investment in a security of this nature, being an illiquid investment, involves a substantial degree of risk and returns are not guaranteed. An explanation of the risks and the full terms and conditions is available at www.tifosi.com slash PUFC. An investment in Peterborough United Bonds should only be made on the basis of a review of the offer document, which will be made available to prospective investors once the priority investment period opens on Monday the 16th of May 2022 for those that have pre-registered or Monday the 23rd of May 2022 for the general public. If you are in any doubt about the action you should take, you are recommended to seek your own financial advice from an independent financial advisor. Nothing said in this podcast is intended to be financial advice and should not be interpreted as such. Okay, well, with that said, let's run the tape on today's episode. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 29 of The Hard Truth Inside the Football Injury Podcast with me, Philip Eidson and Darren McAnthony, chairman and co-owner of Peterborough United. And and to set the scene for you in today's episode, we're actually going to be focusing specifically on the topic of bond financing for football clubs. And we're joined by a couple of special guests who I'm going to introduce shortly. But before I do that, it would be remiss for me to uh, mention or not mention the weekend, Darren. And you finally got a big win. Um, How was the end of the season for you? It was fine. Look, it was nice for the fans to see a win. It was nice to get a clean sheet. It was nice to look like the posh of old. Probably the best part of it was it was nice to get a glimpse of the greatest show on turf in League One next year. So, you know, and what I mean by that is we had, I think, five or six of the players were 21 and under um, that were in that team. So it was full of energy. It's the way the manager wants to play next year. Um, And we're very excited. And obviously, you know, your Rickies, your Pokus, your Ronnies, your Harrison Burrows, um, all those things came together on site. Look, we played a Blackpool side who had nothing to play for. So I don't want to put great emphasis that it was oh, amazing. And, you know, Blackpool have done brilliant, but their players were probably on holiday mentally. So I'm going to give them a little bit of an excuse there. Whilst we were really good, and we should have won by more. It should have been probably 8 9 now. I don't think Cornell actually used his gloves to make a save. So listen, great stuff. Job done. Say goodbye to the fans. What I love about our manager, you got the players on the pitch. And I think it's words to them where. I'm a little bit embarrassed by all of this um, with the fans and everything else because we've been relegated. But remember this feeling because this time next year, we want it to be a celebrated bravery one, which we missed out on last year. So good signs going into the summer. You want to give your, your fans some hope. Our fans are great. They were there after the game, autographs, pictures, the kids, the players. You know, that's what the football club's all about. Win, lose, or draw. Your fans show up. Your fans, you know, you have to reward them in some way. You have to say thank you. And our fans are just like, yeah, they're a credit to the football industry. That and, and look, you're always going to get a few trolls, a few people online, whatever else. But 99.9% of the Peterborough fans are just brilliant. They're just with you no matter what. And and you know they know they see the the derbies, the the, the other clubs in the world about problems and issues. They understand that a relegation isn't a silver bullet. You know, it, it, it is what it is for a club our size. And they know as long as I'm at the club. I'm always going to drive us. I want us to win promotion. I want to do something I've never done in 15 years, and that's actually win a league title. So that is the big aim. So yeah, all good. All good to end the season. You know, was there any frustration that it took, you know, it kind of came on the last day of the season when you got a big win like this? No. You could look back and go, shit, if we'd won the two games against Millwall and Forest and put more pressure on, crap. If you look at three of the last seven home games where we should have beaten, I think it was... Swansea at home, we were 2-1 up, 15 minutes to go. Hammered Luton, hit the post off the line, should have won that game. Um, there's one other one in there we should have won. Again, home our home form caused us, never mind the injury, the issues, the change of manager. Winning six, seven home games out of 23 is not going to keep a club our size in the championship. Look at Blackpool's home form, look at what they did. There's reasons, you know, Luton, why do Luton do so well? Again, clubs like our size, but our fan base have to be really good at home. And we just, from December to April, didn't win any home games. We deserve to get relegated. We go down, we bounce back. That's the way it goes. As shown by Rotherham again. Yeah. Um, now, we're going to do uh, more of a deep dive in a couple of weeks' time for our last podcast of the season. Yeah. But you um, 
uh, published your retain and release list this morning. Yes. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit through who was on there. So, so yeah, basically the players on the contract were, we explained to our fans, we released that. Um, myself, the manager, was assistant, Barry, we sat down 10 days ago and went through, look, who, because we're going to Vegas to meet my partners next week. We have to go through recruitment plans for next year. We have to, look, we've taken a massive financial hit with relegation. That's normal. That happens every time. So now you go about rebuilding and making sure you have the different things in place for that type. Because you don't want to go to the League One and not have a right chance. And we feel we have the bones of a really good squad. And of course, the new manager, he's always going to want to sprinkle his own things here and there with what he wants. And he might have a different formation. He might have a different way of playing. So he might not have that one or two players he wants. So we have to make room. You know, we're a fiscally responsible club. We, we do things the right way. Um, we're going to keep the mass majority of the squad who got promoted, who went down. But, you know, to bring in three, four players, we're going to move on three, four, five players. That's just the right way to do business. Too many clubs don't run themselves that way. We do. We like to make up the holes by maybe selling one big asset, moving a few, you know, spare players out of the club to bring those in. That's how we like to do our business. So today, I think we put on the list Chrissy Pym, Mark Beavers, uh, George Grant, Idris Kanu, uh, and Ryan Brim. And obviously, some of them only have a year left. It's usually our policy to put players up. Again, you don't want to see an asset depreciate, so usually with a year to go, you put them on the list. Um, and, and we thank them for, they've been brilliant for our club. Beavers, Beavers have been brilliant. You know, good captain, one promotion. Um, you know, the manager feels, you know, time to move on. Um, George Grant, you know, Idris Khan has been with us for years. Hasn't quite happened, but played a part last year. Uh, Ryan broom has been out on loan, done really well. There's interest in him. He's got a year left. We'll get a transfer fee. Um, Chrissy Pym won the Golden Gloves in League One. But again, manager wants to go in a different direction. And, and that's just football. That's the way it is. You, you do your best by those players. And then hopefully you get your best value out of those players when you put them on the transfer list. And, you know, we've already had bids and whatever else, and we will have bids for some of those players. So it's not a massive list. It's a small one. Yeah, you know, George Grant was the one that jumped out for me on the list because I know he came in with some fanfare. You know, he'd been successful in the past and he yeah. had a lot of expectations for him this year. It didn't quite work out. And I, I think this potential a championship club might buy him, um, actually. There will be interest. And George was one that was easy because... Not easy. It was one that the manager looked at and went, you know, great guy. He can play in League One for fun, absolutely. He's done brilliant there for Lincoln. His wages, he has a release clause in his contract. He wouldn't come without insisting having one in there. So we just feel, look, instead of waiting till August and we've got the squad together and then someone comes in and activates the release clause, that could put us in a really negative, that could put us in a bad situation. We don't want to go into August and have rumours and speculation of players staying or players going and they're in the squad. They're not in the squad. We have to run things clean. Um, so really, a victim of his own success, victim of his popularity within the industry. Multiple clubs in League One won him already. Um, you know, but if he's not gone, he's not gone. That, that's football. But I'd be very surprised. But you know, nothing but thanks to George. You know, he, he was great when he came in. Didn't quite come off and play as many games we'd like him to. But that happens in the Championship. That's not on the player. He's a terrific character, a lovely human being, and uh, and, and hopefully we'll sell him and he'll do really well out of his next contract. And you just need to plan. By the sounds of it, it's about planning without him as opposed to that yes. not sure, it will he, will, will he, won't he? Well, of course, we've got slots to fill. So we know when we're a goalkeeper or a left-sided centre-half, this, that, I'm not confirming those are the slots. I'm just saying we have four or five. We know what we want. We have four players in each position. Now the work happens where we talk to agents and clubs. We won't be buying players, really, probably maybe one. We don't really need to do that much. The few will be some free signings, some good assets, some good gem collecting. Um, we feel good about it. We also feel that uh, our squad will be younger. As we already have a young squad, but it'll probably be even younger. We then have players who've been injured for long periods of time coming back in. Someone said yesterday about full backs. Well, no, we've got next season, you've got Nathan Thompson back fully fit. You've got Benji who's stepping up. You've got Joe Ward who's played right back in a 4 3 3 in the championship and done brilliant. You've got on the other side, you've got Butler back fit, full, fully fit. Joe Tomlinson who's been a revelation at Swindon. And then Harrison who's going to play more as a left uh, sided midfielder who's been filling in at left wing back and left back and has finished with seven assists and three goals for a just turned 20 year old in the championship, which is unbelievable. So we're stacked for talent in those areas as much as what well, we could have done with some full backs in the champ earlier. Yes, maybe, but look at what those players have done. And we didn't realize the other four get injured. So we feel we're, we're in a good position there. You know what I mean? So players coming back from injuries. Yeah. You know, they're going to be, this is a different manager. It's a different staff. I don't touch wood envisage what we've had which has just looked like a disaster injury list this season. I don't envisage that happening again. I would imagine there'd be a core 8-9 out of the 11 every week playing. I'd have a good young squad 
And as people saw on Saturday, I think we'll have one of the youngest squads in the league. And hopefully we can keep as many of them as we can. Because obviously, some of those young players have been sensational in the championship in a short period of time. And people can see they can play at that level and above. And that's, but I, you know, we do what we can. We've got them on long term contracts. Anyone wants to buy them, it's Brewster's billions. It's the way it's always been. So, so the greatest show on turf, I think it was, you said you need to go and run out and trademark that. Yeah, we had, we had the, the marketing uh, campaign. We had the store and people were like, you got to back that shit up because otherwise it's going to blow up. And I was like, well, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm, being, I'm having fun on a podcast. You want to call me out on that? Fine. I'm not a chairman, I'm El Presidente. We're having fun. I put it on my car park space. You know, we were going to change my car space to scapegoat for this year. You know what I mean? So after after all the moaning about recruitment so and the local media. So I think, yeah, the greatest show on turf in League One would be a good one. But again, they got to back that up. So there's no, there's no point in saying that. That's just me being funny. And I'm sure Swanee and local media, that'll be the headline. You know what I mean? And then when, I don't know, a, a lower club beats us, that'll be thrown back in my face. Like I remember last year... When I said Vengeance Tour, we lost three of our first four games. We got battered at Akron Stanley and everyone's coming on oh, Vengeance Tour. Ah. But we won promotion. So, listen, let's let's see. There's some big things happening. Hit Vegas next week. The manager's got them all coming back early in June. He's given them training programs, which they didn't have the last few years. They know what's going to happen if they're not in condition when they get back. We then obviously have two, three weeks serious training before we go to Portugal on the 2nd of July. We then have two great games in Portugal. That are being played um and then obviously we've got our first home friendly games at london road sorry the western home stadium we haven't had one of them for three years so we've got two of them on the 19th and 23rd for the fans to get excited about season tickets are, are fantastic for club that's been relegated we're, we're on target to smash over four and a half thousand plus um which was a championship target and and again that is our fans going give us more um so yeah we're, we're look we have to be optimistic it's the way i am it's the way i'm built you can't wake up and go oh, it's doom and gloom it's dread it's a relegation and you know everyone's waiting what come into you know, everything all right you've just been right re- listen that's yesterday's news you know today's news is optimism targets objectives and and that's what we're doing so really really excited about it all right well we'll talk a little bit more uh in a couple of weeks time once you get back from vegas as our yes, final we're gonna, we're, we're gonna cover series. Bradford. We're going to cover your guys, the good form, good win on Saturday. We're going to talk about Jamie Walker signing the two-year deal. Yeah. I saw you a little stiffy over that when you saw the news yesterday. So we're going to go good into signing. all the, uh, Yeah, listen, good expectations now for Bradford. Hughes is yeah. setting the standards. So for the Bradford fans who are thinking, oh, shit. Well, hang on, Bradford fans. Don't tune out. Listen in. Because I know you love support and stuff in football. But here's your chance also to actually maybe make some make a return on some money. So, and I have to be careful with what I say, but we're going to go into the bond now with the guys. And there's yep. going to be some legal disclaimers. And then we're going to try and keep it simple, keep it stupid simple so that people understand what this bond is. It's been done at other football clubs before. I'll let you lead in, Philip. Yeah. So, first of all, I want to welcome uh, who have been waiting patiently for us, uh, Tim Williams, uh, who is the ex CFO of Inter Milan and uh, director of finance at Manchester United, and now the managing director for the UK at Tiffany Capital and Advisory. Tifosi. People right. It's called Tifosi. I'm All the right. only one out of everyone who actually, you know, because I'm into branding. Tifosi. It's a good name. Well, maybe that's a branding issue then. No. <laughs> I, I actually like the brand. I think it's a good name, Tifosi. It's a bit of class to it, you know, Tifosi. So there you go. I'm just correcting you there. Thank you. So it's 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 not unusual for me to get an intro, to screw up an introduction, <laughs> as we've seen in the past. Um, but also joined by James Pollock, who's the chief marketing officer as well at Tifosi. So first of all, Tim and uh, James, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the pod today. Our pleasure. Uh, good good evening. Good afternoon. Um, and what we want to do is I want to look at this in two parts because we talked about uh, talking about specifically the uh, the posh bond that is uh, being launched right now for Peterborough United. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about kind of financing in football clubs more generally. Um, just to give some context and also for folks who are supporters of other clubs as well, kind of understand how the behind the scenes kind of works and how their clubs get financed. And so first of all, I'm going to ask the uh, the question of uh, to James, if you could just share a little bit more about who is Tifosi. Sure. Um, so Tifosi was founded around uh, six, seven years ago, and 
essentially founded by a, a former financier, a, a guy who worked in banking, um, named Fausto Zanaton, and uh, Gianluca Vialli, the, the, the former uh, Chelsea player, Juventus player, and, and now working with the Italian national team. And the idea was to, to help clubs to, to finance themselves in ways that you know, hadn't previously been available. Um, we actually started off with what was then straight crowdfunding or fan funding, as we called it. Um, we did some crowdfunding campaigns with a number of clubs, including Bradford City. You might remember, Phil, the uh, Upgrade the Parade campaign. And then about um, a few years ago, we, we received our license. So we'd applied for our license from the Financial Conduct Authority that would allow us to actually issue proper uh, financial instruments, financial regulated financial products. And so with the platform that we were using initially for crowdfunding, we then evolved that platform and added a lot of additional features to allow us then to give people the opportunity to make real investments into clubs. And they can do that in two ways. Sometimes we've worked with the club to issue shares. We did that, for example, with Rangers in Scotland last year. Uh, we sold uh, about four and a half million pounds worth of, of shares directly to supporters. Um, and sometimes we use bonds and bonds are like uh, uh, basically a loan from the supporter to the club. So they give a, a, a small amount of money or an amount of money that they, uh, they can afford, that they consider is reasonable for this kind of investment. And the club will hold on to that money and obviously use that money for uh, development projects typically you know, normally it's something like stadium development or training grounds or whatever um, and then they'll pay an interest rate on that as a way of you know remunerating that investor for giving them their money for that period of time and then at the end of the term which is typically five years in the ones that we've done uh, the money is then repaid along with the final interest payment um, i'm sure we'll go into more detail on on that and why that makes sense. And I would certainly uh, refer to Tim to talk about other options that clubs have in terms of financing. Um, but the last sort of chapter in our, in our journey to date has been that more recently we're, a, I would say, a much more holistic uh, kind of financing company for the sports industry. And as alongside our platform, where we're working with the clubs like Peterborough, uh, we've previously worked with QPR, with Norwich uh, and with others. Um, we now also have the advisory part of our business, which actually works with clubs and also with investors, larger institutional type of investors on transactions such as buying you know, a stake in a club or buying a whole club or, or perhaps uh, identifying an institution to help with a larger uh, scale financing for a club. Um, and, that, and that's something that you know, sort of sits within a separate group within our within our uh, company. So we've kind of come from, you know, Tifosi actually means fans in Italian. And, you know, it was founded by Gianluca and Fausto. They're both Italian. Uh, so that's where the whole idea comes from. If you're a Formula One fan, you probably recognize the word from Ferrari. They use the word Tifosi, the fans of, of Ferrari. Um, and we anglicize that because we're a London, a London company, um, although we do work across Europe. Um, and, and that's where it came from, the crowdfunding, the fan funding idea, which then evolved into proper securities, proper investments. And then on top of that, we then moved more into advisory in the last two to three years. And we've been involved in some fairly substantial transactions in, in European football in particular. Um, so that's what Tifosi is. And um, yeah, maybe I'll leave it there because I think Tim would probably be better to talk about other ways of financing clubs. Yeah, no, it's interesting to kind of see the evolution, as you mentioned there. You know, I knew of Tifosi from the Upgrade the Parade campaign that you talked about at Bradford City, which was, I don't know, probably five, six years ago. It's probably right when you started. Um, I think we still have a, a, a new, relatively new scoreboard to thank for that campaign. Um, but, you know, kind of seeing how that has evolved from fan and crowdfunding into kind of more structured um, ways that you support clubs in their operating model and financing their operating model. Um, so it would be a great time to just to bring in um, Tim, just to ask, you know, you've obviously been involved a lot in the financing of, uh, in, in financing day-to-day -day operations, but also capital investments at football clubs. What are some of the traditional ways that a football club would typically finance? And, and perhaps, you know, you look at that one from a day-to-day -day perspective of financing ops, but also financing more, investment like structural investment um yeah. in the football club too no i mean it's a it's a it's a very good question it's a it's, it's potentially and i will try and keep this fairly short is a, is a very long answer actually and i think it's something that has really evolved over 
I would say probably the last, you know, 15 or 20 years. And, you know, I suppose when you look back, maybe 15 or 20 years, football clubs, be they, you know, top of the Premier League or, you know, smaller clubs would typically be financed by, you know, a, 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 a guy with, I guess, you know, plenty of money who wants to support his local club. And he's very, very happy to continue to do that and to invest in the club and, and be the face of the club. And I think as the sport's grown over the past 20 years, you know, we've seen this grow at every single level of the professional game in England, that the, the requirements for capital, for, even for a small club, are so, are so large now that it's important that clubs are able to look at more structured ways of raising money. And that can range from some of the more complex stuff that you see in the really large clubs. So, you know, at Manchester United, we were involved in, a, in an IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. We were involved in a very structured uh, debt instrument that was listed on the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, which required, you know, you know an enormous amount of lawyers involved, unfortunately. And, you know, bankers, you know, and, you know, and, and not the kind of typical bankers that, that clubs would have dealt with in the past, such as the retail bankers, but, you know, Goldman Sachs and JP Morgans of this world, which are, you know, making much more of an entry into this space now because the game has grown so much and the money that's been ploughed into the game has increased so much. But, you know, those instruments have become more and more complex you know, culminating in something we did at Inter Milan back in December 17, which was a very structured debt instrument, which again listed on the New York Stock Exchange for some 300 million euros. You know, and these are transactions which take, you know, six to nine months to organise, you know, require an awful lot of, of, of brain power, an awful lot of people around, you know, the, supporting that to make it happen. The, the problem with that, is that it's all very well when you are pretty much a relegation safe, top of the Premier League, top of Serie A type football club. The issue comes when you are, you know, getting towards the bottom of the Premier League, Championship, League One, where simply you, there isn't the access to those complex instruments. There isn't the, there isn't frankly the resource available in and outside of the club in order to be able to support a capital raising like that. And, and, and I'm afraid to say that a lot of the large institutions just simply can't make enough money from doing a 5, 10, 15, 20 million deal for a smaller club. And, and that's where you have to look for, and I'm going to use this word very carefully. You don't, I'm going to say the word esoteric solutions. And sometimes esoteric can be used in this kind of a pejorative way, which is, you know, strange, kind of fanciful and, and possibly a little risky. But what I mean by that is is that we have to look for you know less traditional forms of, of looking to raise capital. Typically, football clubs have relied on player sales and factoring the receivables from those player sales, which is you know put very simply, you know you buy you sell a player for say five million quid. Typically, you would receive that in instalments. What you do is you get a bank to effectively give you the instalments up front, less a small margin for their trouble. And that's been really the only way, and I'm sure, Dara, you'd agree with me, the only way that, that smaller clubs have able, been able to get access to, to significant sums. The worst part is, Tim, that you say about the, the factoring actually is, is horrendous from a, um, an interest rate perspective. It's not as you think, oh, three, four percent, you factor five million, six million, whatever. They don't. It's more loan shark rates, actually, a lot of the time. There's very few factoring companies out there. There's three or four we've always used. And there's something we've done all the time. For example, we sell a player for six million. One of the first we did was Dwight Gale. And we were getting paid three plus three a year later. And we were like, well, we'd like to get our budget done for this year. We need to bring players in. We need to do this. We're going to pay to factor the final three. I, was, I saw something about Norwich and what they did with their training ground. And when we were looking to do the dome, and we ended up covering the cost of the dome and doing whatever else. But when we were looking to do the dome, it was when I started going into Tafosi and what are they doing and whatever else. It was like, okay, that actually makes more sense because it's a two-pronged thing. One, you're not paying, you know, ridiculous fees, but you're also getting your fans involved. Whilst at the same time, your fans can actually make a good percentage of money, if that makes sense. And it's, it's, I always said this about the bond. It's not that we need the bond. We've, for 15 years, run our club really responsibly and done what we've needed to do, and we'll continue doing that. 
But again, it was a great chance to, okay, well, instead of maybe if we do sell a player, maybe we won't factor it this year. Because if we do the bond and the bond raise and whatever else, and it goes to plan like we all think it will, well, actually, that will do a lot of the things we do normally when we bring transfer sales forward. And our fans will actually earn from it, which is a win-win. And that was really, you know, when I started diving into it and looking into it, you know, the factory world is a very expensive world. This bond raising isn't as expensive, but at the same time, it's fan participation. So again, win-win. And that was really why I'd said to the guys, you've got to look at, I've seen QPR have done it really successfully. Norris did it tremendously successfully, you know, because I think at the same time, they got promoted a year later. Their whole focus, Norwich, is on their academy training ground. And these are all the things we're trying to get right at our club. Where are, where, and I'm probably jumping the gun here, lads, and, and talking for you, but we were looking and going, where can we improve as a club? Yes, selling players. I'm not saying it's easy. It's something we always do, but we want to do a new restaurant. We want to do something with a stand. We want to do that at the training ground. You know, these are all the little notches that we do well that give us a chance against the big boys. And, and that's where we were like, let's draw up a wish list of things that will improve the infrastructure at our football club. And that's kind of how this whole thing came about, really. So, again, I apologise if I've jumped the gun and, 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 and spoken ahead there. No, not at all, Darren. I think I was just about to, to really add to that. And I think that one of the things that I think Tifosi as a business does really well is actually look to work with clubs like Peterborough. And back to the examples that we've raised, you know, we did an equity raise for, for, equity raise for Glasgow Rangers. We worked with QPR with Norwich. You know, clubs where you know, with the greatest respect to these clubs. And these are, you know, they're good sized clubs, but typically can't get access to that large amount of institutional capital. And so what we offer is not only the access to those capitals, um, either via the fan solutions or potentially other solutions um, that we see in the marketplace, but, but we offer the ability to organize that, to work with those clubs and, you know, um, frankly not screw them for enormous fees in order to do so and you know we feel that this is a real partnership approach it's a win-win situation and you know with what with what happened with football you know just a year ago today you know this is a serious financial instrument this is something that investors have got to think very seriously about but this is also about ensuring that fans feel part of the club and that's a really important part of of a lot of club strategies, which is to bring the fans, you know, into the ecosystem of the club and let them feel part of it. Absolutely, and I, I, I like that about it because we I did a lot of my own due diligence and spoke to people at various clubs, and you guys have got a really really good reputation, you know, amongst lots of clubs. And you know, you have to understand, Phil, we get offered every year. You read about the big funds out there that are putting, mm-hmm. helping Burnley buy their club. Derby, this, that, whatever else. And what people don't understand, and I'm not speaking for those clubs, I'm just throwing examples out there. Some of these people that are coming in and saying, well, we'll give you this money and that money. The rates are horrendous. You know, what I liked about this was, it, it was just, it made perfect sense. And it wasn't that ridiculous amounts of money. And every football club out there, let's not lie about this. Every football club always needs more money. Whether it's from an owner, whether it's from factory and players, whether it's from doing whatever else. But... The beauty about this is when you go and get loans like that, what I've talked about previously is the club gets this infusion of money and there's no restrictions on how they spend it. What I liked about reading about Tifosi and going into it was it was great because you got your fans involved, but there are also covenants in, in, in the agreement that the owners can't take that money. You know, that money's ring fenced, you know what I mean? To do the things that you talk about with the fans, whether you're improving the training ground, whether you're improving the stadium, whether you're building a new restaurant. So what I want to do, I want to talk about some of the the intricacies of uh, the bond itself in in a couple of minutes. But Dara, I wanted to ask you, you know, you've kind of alluded to some of the ways that you'd be looking to spend the money from this bond raise. What are those and, and why did you decide that those are things that would be important for the football club to invest in right now? So there's three key things we want to get from this to, to do. You know, one is the safe standing, you know, and people are going to say, oh, you're in League One. and Yeah, but, you know, we, we put this in motion months ago and we always knew that we were at our limit now on, on being able to have the stand the way it is. So we feel in nine months all go, goes well, we're back in the championship and we don't want to close a stand. So and, and that's one. That's one key thing. So there's a substantial cost to do that. Second thing is we want to put in a sports bar. And we've been looking to do this for a long time. And a sports bar, what we want to put in there is well over half a million pounds to do that. 
And that's something we feel that will, will help with our catering. More importantly, it's something that's going to be open six, seven days a week. So you, you got a lot of college students with the new university. You got a World Cup coming up, you know, that's going to be in November. You know, that can add to our bottom line. That can help our growth. You know, so that's a big thing. We then have planning commitments once we get all this signed off for the new stadium and the land. And there's a substantial amount to put in there even before we get approval for that land and everything else that we have to commit to and planning funds. And people will say, yeah, but you're moving from the stadium. Why are you putting that money in there? Because well, we're not moving tomorrow. You know, the, this could be two, three, four years. So we need to make sure, you know, you can't just say to the fans, well, we're going to let the stadium run down. We're not going to do the toilets. And we're not going to do that stand. And we're not going to give you a nice bar. Because you know what? It's only four years. Well, four years is a long time in football. So we want to make sure that we, you know, for those new fans we keep bringing in and the current fans, that the facilities are family friendly, that the facilities are, you know, tick all the boxes. And if you want to be a top 15 championship club in our current format, that's just not good enough. So if we are there for two years, three years, four years, five years, those things need to happen and they've got to get done and they're going to get done regardless. Do you know what I mean? So that, that was a big part of why we did it. Yeah. And I imagine that you've done like you, you, you know, the payback periods of those investments. So, you yeah. know, putting in a bar that's going to cost you, let's say half a million. And I don't know what the, the right number is, but let's say it's that, then you've got the payback period mapped out of what that means in terms absolutely. of that returning cash uh, essentially back into the business. Absolutely. All those things. So we know that's something that we're, we're missing out on six figures every year, you know, so that, that's massive. The safe standing, you know, again, it's almost like a pilot program for one of the first clubs to do it the way we're doing it. That's going to be massive. Do you know what I mean? And, and, and the uptake for season tickets in that area already are massive. So again, really important, that planning process. There's other little things we want to do around the stadium to make improvements. You know, we did the rabbit's den. We have to move that. We have to, you know, and they're like for the children in the school program we've got running. And their families, do you know what I mean? So I don't know if you've ever been to any of the bathrooms at our stadium. You know, there's just so many things that we can modernize and make better. And we're trying to do it all the time. But unfortunately, Rome wasn't built in a day and you can't do it all at once, you know. But something like this allows us to make those positive changes actually a lot quicker. So that's why we're doing it. Um, Tim, could you sp speak a little bit more specifically to like what the posh bond is, what the offering is, and, and how you go about actually designing an offering based on the things that Dara has kind of informed to firstly of what, what he's trying to do and the funds that he's trying to raise and why he's trying to raise them. Like, how do you go about designing something that creates an, you know, an interesting uh, investment opportunity while supporting the needs of the football club? Sure. And, and, you know, the first, the first question we ask is, you know, what does the club want to do? You know, we want to sit down with the guys in the club and, and find out exactly what they want to do. And I think James has alluded to earlier that, you know, and, and Dara certainly, that there's a real sweet spot here, which is, you know, infrastructure investments for the benefit of the club and for the benefit of those people going to the stadium. And I think this is a real, it's a real important factor that the club is using that money for those kind of investments. But we sit down at length and talk with the club. We look at the financials. We look at track record. You know, there's, there's a lot of work that goes into our discussions with with the owners of the club, with Dara, with Jason, with, with Stuart, to make sure that we are all in agreement as to how we want to work this. The beauty of this of this solution is though that it is quite tailorable to how the club wants to wants to work. So you know, with with the with the Peter Bond, it's it's five years. It's a nine percent cash interest. We have a fifteen percent promotion bonus, which if they're promoted in that five year period, there is a one off bonus interest payment of of fifteen percent. We can put this into a into a tax free ISA. We also set a minimum investment on this, and what that minimum investment is designed to do is to make sure that it's it's attractive to somebody who is serious about investing. Um, but also not such a large amount that it's not within the reach of, of many of the supporters of the club. You know, accept 500 as a minimum investment is still a lot of money to a lot of people, particularly in this day and age, particularly with the cost of living crisis. But we're not asking here for a minimum investment of, you know, £20,000, £50,000. Um, you know, it's something that is is hopefully you know, achievable for an awful lot of people who want to invest in the club. We work very closely with the club to determine what the right interest rate would be um, and whether that interest rate, as we've seen on previous bonds, is a mixture of 
of cash and club credit or pure cash. And I think collectively we landed on a number of 9%, which, which felt right given other bond issues that we've seen in the market. You know, also right with, with, with rising interest rates at the moment and, and the cost of capital and right given the overall structure of this, of this bond that we're issuing. And I think probably the longest discussion that we had was regarding the uh, regarding the promotion bonus, um, because there is absolutely no doubt that it's a very attractive bonus at fifteen percent. And you know we had you know pushback from the club saying, "Hey, you know this is a lot of money," but equally, this is also about people investing in the success of the club. You know we want that club to be back in the championship. You know we want to see it back as soon as possible. So we want to make sure that the investment is right, but also that those fans are rewarded when that happens and hopefully when that happens for their commitment to the club in terms of the money that they're putting in. And I think that's something that was very important to everybody around the table from Tifosi side right through to Peterborough side. Um, and I think, as I said, and just to really close on this, it's it's a solution that We've done a number of these, and each one has been has been different. It's the same basic, it's the same basic thing. It's a say, it's, it's a bond or it's an equity issue. But it, what we're not doing is saying to Peterborough, you know, here is a solution off the shelf, take it or leave it. This is very much something we have a real iterative process with the club, with consideration of the fans, with consideration of the investment that they're planning to make sure that it's right for the club. So we do put an awful lot of work into that in the planning process to make sure that it works across all sides. And given those interest rates, it sounds that it's given everything we've talked about before, it's for the football club it's a, a win because the football club can raise money at a capital a cost of capital that is lower than a um, you know a public market let's say or going to you know other financing other source of finance for a investor it's a higher rate of interest than putting money in the bank, for example. But the club is what the club does is it enables it to reward the fans with like you rather pay the fans a nine percent interest rate and a fifteen percent promotion bonus than you would pay a banker. You know those same interest rates. Well, this, keeps it this is a comment that we've heard. Yeah. This is a comment that we've heard before. That yeah, it's absolutely right. You know, any club can go to a bank. Uh, and raise this kind of capital. I'm not going to say here now what those what the conditions of that would be, you know, because you can't again have a one size fits all. Every club is different, but you know, comments I've heard before from other people and other clubs who have done this is that you know, yes, we're raising the money from the fans, but I would rather pay my interest to the fans than pay my interest to a large banking institution. You know, it's bringing the money, it's putting that interest back into the football club effectively putting that interest back into the fan pockets uh you know and giving them a return for that loyalty uh, and support that they're giving mm-hmm. and, and I've, had, I've had so many people friends of mine who are not even posh fans saying are we allowed you know invest in the bond going, yeah of course if it's in the jurisdiction that's the correct one you have to do your due diligence on that and make sure absolutely and all the information is 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 on the website um you know we've obviously had we did a lot of marketing before this about, you know, what's the sweet spot, what's the right thing. And there was a big uptick, a lot of interest. And obviously a lot of planning came between us and these guys about, right, what is the amount we want to look at raising? What's the amount we want to, you know, pay? And obviously since then there's been questions. You know, I want to make it very clear to our fans and anyone in football, there's no obligation for anyone to, to take this bond offer up. Okay. I want to make that very, very clear. We very loyal supporters like you do at Bradford. And they're going to come sun, rain or shine and watch us yeah. play football. And if this isn't for them, don't even read it. Don't get involved. However, if you're sitting at home and it's something where you're looking at and going, oh, you know, this looks quite interesting. Well, that's great. We welcome that. But at the end of the day, if I meet a fan, I'm not going to ask them, did you invest in the bond? Did you do this? Did you? Yeah. Well, I, I that makes you a better fan than somebody else. I have been this morning from a great fan, Liz. She, she has season tickets. She sponsors a player. And she emailed me this morning and said, by the way, DMAC, you know, have a great summer. You know, I've done my season ticket. We're sponsoring Joe Ward next year. You know, my mom. And, and by the way, we're taking up the bond thing. And, and you know, my response to her was, look, Liz, no matter what you do, I always appreciate your support of the club. But, you know, none of that is, is an obligation. Forget the bond for a minute. You don't have to buy a season ticket. That's down to the individual. 
you know that's how we operate and a couple of other things you know some of the fans some people have asked well you know why are we giving you our money and da 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 well look, at the end of the day like i said before and the guys it's, it's all there in, in the in the details on the website you know there are restrictions and investor protections preventing owners like us from misdirecting those funds those funds all right are meant for some of the all the things i've spoke about on this on this podcast the improvements we want to make so pw united is i'm not saying it's a massive football club but i've always said it's a well-run football club okay and whilst we can never ever say the words this is guaranteed and i would never there's nothing guaranteed about bonds like this there never is when you buy them um at the end of the day i say to our fans and whatever else and put the bond to the side when you're buying a season ticket when you're coming to support us you know my obligation is is to make sure you get to see your 23 games every year my obligation is to make sure you have a football team you can support. I can't even guarantee a promotion. I get fans saying, we didn't get promoted. We got relegated. We this, whatever else. So it's never a guarantee either way. You're not guaranteed to stay in the championship. You're not guaranteed to win a promotion from League One. But if you look at the body of work over 15 years, you've had plenty of each. So, But again, there's never a guarantee on that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this bond, all I always say to the fans, and even my friends, family, you've got other people from Australia contact me, do your own due diligence. All of the information is on our website. Tofosi have enough information on their website as well. I believe it's tofosi.com. You know, do your own due diligence. Make the decision for you. Um, and that's a great segue, actually, into my final question for you, James. And that's if, if fans, whether they're Peterborough United fans or, um, you know, other fans that have listened to this and are interested, like, what's the next step? Where do they go to find out, you know, find out what the the mechanics are? And, you know, there's some specific questions we didn't cover today that are very kind of in the in the details of how a bond like this works um, and to express their interest, you know, if they are interested, where should they go? Yeah, I feel I'll try and I'll try and cover off sort of the main things that people need to know. So right now we're in what's called pre-registration. Um, so we're taking uh, people can sign up on our website, and if they sign up, then we have a priority period when we will email all those people who've signed up as pre-registration uh, on Monday, and they will get a priority period of one week. Uh, to look at the investment and decide if they would like to invest, they can decide to go. And invest. just to jump in, that would be Monday, May 16th. Yeah. That's correct. Sorry, Monday, May 16th. And then on Monday 23rd, it will open to the general public. But the idea is, you know, if you're really interested in this, you kind of book your opportunity to make sure you get a chance by, by coming into that first period. When, when they go onto that investment page, really importantly, they'll be able to Uh, They have to do a couple of things that are mandated by the FCA. They have to self-certify. I won't go into a lot of detail on what that is. And they have to pass what's called an eligibility questionnaire. If they they don't do those both steps, they won't be allowed to invest. And that is really to make sure they understand that everybody that's looking at this understands uh, the nature of the investment and the risks associated with it. I'm talking of risks. um, Once they've self-certified on the platform, on the website, they'll be able to access the offer document. And that's that's the most important thing I think I want to say is, you know, Dara's spoken about, you know, not everybody might want to invest. And look, this is an investment that will be suitable for some people and not suitable for others. And that's absolutely fine. The offer document is there to provide all of the information that you need to know before making a decision on whether to invest. And what we would say is that you should make a thorough review of that offering document Um, There is a section in there called risk factors, which will spell out in detail the risks associated with investing. And we would encourage everybody to have a proper look of that. Um, And in fact, it's a requirement to say that you have read that document as you go on and make an investment. Uh, You need to tick a box and say you've read that document. Um, So that's really important as well, um, that that you have a, a good read of that before making your decision. And you make a decision only based on that. Um, And then I think, you know, if you're in any way unsure, if there's anything that you're concerned about or don't think you understand properly, to talk with an independent financial advisor, Um, because, you know, none of what we're saying today is investment advice. We're not allowed to give investment advice. Um, It is up to the individual to satisfy themselves that they've understood and that they've got every piece of advice that they might need from somebody who's independent and qualified to give that advice. Um, a couple of other bits. So, yeah, the, the minimum investment is £500. As has been discussed, if you would like to, you can open, if you're a UK taxpayer, you can open an ISA. It's called an Innovative Finance ISA, and you can open that through the Tifosi platform. And up to £20,000 can be invested in your ISA 
or, or a range of ICEs in an, in an individual tax year. If you've already used your ISA allocation for this year, it is possible to transfer existing ISA monies from another ISA. So if you have a cash ISA with a bank or a, a, another type of institution, you can actually request to transfer that across. Um, the interest will be paid on a, on a set date each year. So it's an annual interest payment. And if you're in the ISA, it will be paid gross. So you'll receive 100% of the interest. If you're not in an ISA or if you're overseas or whatever, it will be subject to withholding tax, uh, which is 20%. So you'll be paid the interest minus that 20%. Um, those, I think, are the key things um, that are worth mentioning. I think the other thing is just to be transparent about risk as well. I mean, these are unsecured bonds. Okay, So what that means is you know, there is no security. For example, they're not secured against the stadium or against the training ground or something like that. So that, that is what means, that is why there is a degree of risk, because there's no security there to be you know, backing it up. And, and that, if you like, is reflected in that interest rate. Um, you know, an interest rate should reflect the appropriate, you know, should be at the appropriate level to reflect the degree of risk that's being taken. On the other hand, as has been said, I think Dara mentioned, there are some covenants which put in certain protections for the investor. Um, and those include um, a, a covenant over where the funds can be directed. They can't be directed to repay the owner's existing debt, for example. Um, there's a covenant that if the club were to be bought by a, a new owner, if 50% of the club were bought, the bonds would be paid back um, straight away. And, you know, those sorts of things are there designed to give the investor a bit more comfort about taking the risks that they are taking. Um so, so those will all be included. They're all in the offering document, and that's the sort of thing that you can read about in there. But I think it's. So I think we've seen the question: why? Why is it you know nine percent? That's quite unusual for um, you know current interest rate environment where most people can't get you know one percent on their money at the moment if they're in a bank account, and that's the reason. You know, in the bank account, your money is effectively secured by that bank, um, and typically it's under the FSCS, the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. This is a different type of product. There is a, a higher degree of risk and therefore it comes with a higher rate of return. But all of those risks are fully spelled out in the offer document. And, uh, and I think that's what, uh, just to come back to that point, that's what I would encourage is, you know, once that's available in the investment page, as I say, we're currently pre-registering. When the investment page opens to the priority people on the, first, on the 16th of May, you can download that offer document and have a really good thorough read of all of those. So go to www.posh.com for obviously more details on it. And obviously, what's the... no, no. I, if I can say, Daryl, I would, I, would, I would go straight to our website, which is www.tifosi.com slash P-U-F-C. So that's, that's Tifosi spelled T-I-F-O-S-Y. Uh, slash, uh, dot com slash pufc and, and and all the information is there. The offer document is not available there this week before the sixteenth of May, as I've mentioned. It's only open. Uh, it's only available on the investment page, which will open on on Monday. Tim, James, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Dara, uh, thanks as ever. I hope that you have a successful trip to Vegas. Um, and we look forward to recording our last episode in a couple of weeks' time when you get back. Um, talk to you all again soon, everybody. Bye.